Amen. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. Today we are continuing in our sermon series that we started last week called This Is Us. If you have your Bible or Bible app, you can go ahead and turn to our main passage, 2 Timothy chapter 316. Uh, 2 Timothy 316. If you did not bring a Bible with you, you are welcome to use one of the Bibles located underneath the seat in front of you and turn to page 1182. And as always, if you don't have a Bible at your house that you can read or understand easily, we invite you to take one of our Bibles home with you. Read it and begin to apply it to your life because we really believe at Calvary that if we read God's Word and apply His Word, He will change our lives. Now, last week we kicked off this series talking about the mission of Calvary. And the mission of Calvary, you'll see it on the, big, uh, on the big wall out in our Connection Center. The mission of Calvary is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. There's nothing more important than that. It's to lead people in a life -changing, to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Our mission is the answer to why we do anything here at Calvary. Uh, it's why we gather for worship each weekend. It's why we volunteer and serve in our community. Our mission answers the question, why do we have a children's ministry? Or why do we build wells or dig wells in Africa? Uh, why we have a student ministry? Why we have life groups? Our mission is the answer to why we serve coffee in the Connection Center. It's why we have nice, comfortable chairs to sit on. It's why we have lights and worship. It's to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything we do is to point people to Jesus. And for about the last 10 months or for about 10 months in 2019, 2020, I don't even remember because of 2020 and 2021, it's all melting together. But for about 10 months, we had a team of about 13 people begin to ask ourselves, talk to God, pray to God, asking for wisdom as to what are our core values here at Calvary? What is it that makes Calvary unique and what is it that motivates us to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus? And over that period of time, we've identified five core values that honestly, we believe that if we all practice these core values on a regular basis, if we implement them into our lives, if we implement them in our homes, in our marriages, with our children, and if we value them individually, then we're by default going to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. There, there's not another church in the nation that has identified these as their core values. Uh, there's not something that we jumped online and we said, oh, these look like great core values. Let's steal them and put them on our website and let's tell people that this is who we are. These are unique to Calvary, and it's our prayer that as we walk through this series, they'll become unique to you. That these core values will begin to, to uh, identify who you are and what you value. So over the next five weeks, we're going to be discussing these five core values. The first one we're talking about tonight is relatable truth. But the, the other uh, four are transparent living, contagious celebration, uncomfortable grace and radical service. Those are what we've identified as our core values. And as I said before, today we're talking about relatable truth. Now you might've noticed, I even did it tonight, but every one of our teaching pastors, as we begin our sermons, will number one, invite you to take your copy of God's word, turn to a specific passage that we're gonna be looking at. And then we invite you, if you don't have a Bible, to take one home with you. At Calvary, we believe that if we read and apply God's word, God will change our lives. We really believe that. We say it every week. You hear Pastor Chad say it. You'll hear Robert say it. You'll hear myself say it. 
every single week because we believe that the Bible literally will change our lives. Now that statement is developed from a key passage uh, that we're going to be looking at. I've never met anybody that didn't want to experience life change in one way or another. And when we talk about experiencing life change, we talk about reading and applying God's word. Our value, we believe it so wholeheartedly, we're going to say it sermon after sermon after sermon. We believe that people want a better marriage. We believe that people want better relationships at work. We believe people want better relationships with their family members, that they wanna be better off financially, that they want more peace, more joy. They want to experience more hope in their lives. And the best and the most practical way that a follower of Jesus can experience ongoing life change in their life is by implementing and practicing the value found in 2 Timothy 3.16. Paul wrote this in 2 Timothy 3.16. He said, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, I'm a pretty pretty simple man. I I like simple explanations, and that's one of the reasons why I I read out of the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation uh, reads like this. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong, and it teaches us to do what's right. And so not being a Bible scholar, but being able to take these two Bible passages or two translations and smash them together, we more easily grasp this plain, simple truth about the Bible, that the Bible is God-breathed and teaches right and wrong. Now, you were supposed to gasp at that incredible insight that I just gave to you. You were supposed to marvel and stand up and start fanning yourself with the wisdom that I just shared with you. The Bible is God-breathed and teaches right and wrong. See, the Bible is not just merely a religious book. It's not just a collection of churchy words and churchy letters uh, all gathered together. The Bible is a collection of 66 books that God, the creator of the universe, the creator of the galaxies, your creator, he breathed out these words into the minds and the hearts of men and they recorded his words. For the first season of human history, God walked and talked with Adam and Eve, the first two people that he created. And then Adam and Eve rebelled against God and God began communicating through the prophets and he began communicating through uh, the apostles and in Jesus that we see in the New Testament. Adam and Eve preferred living for themselves rather than living for their creator. They wanted nothing to do with God and so God began to speak in other ways. His communication, God's interaction with humans in history All is recorded in this book. The Bible is God breathed. The words that you're hearing right now, the words that are coming through this microphone and coming out of the sound system, those are Joe breathed. I'm sucking in oxygen. I'm using my diaphragm. I'm pushing out the air into my, it goes up through my vocal cords. It vibrates my vocal cords just right. These are Joe breathed words but God spoke into the hearts and the minds of the apostles and prophets and he gave us these words that have stood the test of time for thousands and thousands of years men and women gave their lives literally gave their lives in order to be able to record these words in a way that you and I can understand That's how much God loves creation. 
He, he didn't just create us and then abandon us. He did, it wasn't a crapshoot where God said, okay, I'm going to make humans. Oh, that didn't go well. <laughs> right? I, I mean, God created us and then he loves us so much. He wants to continue to stay in a relationship with you and I. And the number one way he does that is through the Bible. Even when we feel alone, our feelings are wrong. Through the Bible, we are encouraged. Through the Bible, we are comforted. And the Bible tells us what is right and wrong with our lives. Now, if you're like me, I love words of affirmation. I love getting the attaboy, good job. I love knowing when I'm doing something well, and I love knowing when I'm doing something right. It motivates me to continue to do what is right. But if you're also like me, not many people like to be told they are wrong. I don't like it when my wife tells me I'm wrong. I don't like it when my coworkers tell me I'm wrong. I don't like it sometimes when God tells me I'm wrong. It bothers me. It aggravates me. And today the culture of the world seems to embrace what is wrong and rejects what is right. If an athlete or a politician is a follower of Jesus and they use their platform to, to be a great role model and appoint other people to Jesus, he or she is ridiculed and mocked by the media and by the culture of the world. But if an athlete or a politician uses their platform to promote an anti-Christian view, they are lifted up and held as an inspiration to the entire world. The reality is, if you enjoy doing wrong, the Bible is going to offend you. If you live your life and enjoy doing what is wrong, the Bible is going to cut against your heart. If you enjoy doing wrong and you don't want to be corrected, Sermons here at Calvary are going to offend you from time to time. They're going to step on your toes. You're going to think that Pastor Chad and Robert and I are getting all up in your business. You're going to get aggravated and agitated because there's right and there's wrong. And the Bible teaches us both. And we acknowledge since the Bible is God breathed, it has authority over our lives. We can depend on it upon the, uh, as a foundation to build our lives, to build our marriages, to build our homes, to build our children. We can depend on the word of God because it's God breathed. And since it is God breathed, it has authority more so than I ever could. And when we put together sermons, we don't put together sermons uh, that are wagging our finger at you. You may notice that both all of us, uh, for our teaching team, are pretty transparent when it comes to God's word. We look in the mirror first and we point the word of God at our own hearts and our own lives and we begin to apply it to our lives before we ever teach it and begin to apply it or, or develop applications for you. And we don't preach so that you can wag your finger at people in the community. We don't preach so you can nudge your spouse and say, hey, did you hear what he just said? We really and honestly develop sermons out of God's word that you can easily apply to your personal life. Not for somebody else to apply to their life, but for you and I to apply to our lives. And that's because we believe that if, if people in our church is going to grow spiritually, then the, the best application for spiritual growth, or I'm sorry, the best sign for spiritual growth is you personally applying God's word to your life. 
And we believe that spiritual growth is evident inside each of us when we apply God's word to our lives. And so the question that we're going to focus on for the rest of the message is, how do you apply God's word to your life? It was 1996, it was five years after I became a follower of Jesus where finally somebody helped me understand how to read God's word and apply it to my life in a very simple way. It was five years after I surrendered my life to Jesus. It was five years after I recognized that God was right and I was wrong. It was five years after I had surrendered my life to Jesus that I became a born again follower of Christ that I finally understood how to read and apply God's word to my life. Because to be honest, there were many times when I would open up my Bible to read it and I would drift off to sleep. There were many times I would open up my Bible to to read it and my mind would begin to wander and I would begin to think about everything else I needed to accomplish during the day. Raise your hand if you're like that. Some of you are sleeping right now. (laughs) And it's not my fault, it's spiritual warfare. So just blame the devil. So how do we read the Bible for application? How do we read the Bible? How do we value that as individuals just as we value it as a church? How do we read the Bible without our minds drifting off? Today, I'm gonna give you an acrostic tool that's going to help you apply God's word to your life. And it's up to you if you choose to use it. But I guarantee you this, if you begin to apply this acrostic to your personal uh, journey with God, your personal relationship with God, as you read God's word, you will experience life change. Now, here's what I want to first suggest before we get into the acrostics. I know maybe some of you read devotionals or some of you have a, 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 something else that you do to grow in your relationship with God. Here's what I want to encourage you to begin to do. I want you to go to the New Testament and find one of the shorter letters that one of the apostles wrote to followers of Jesus. And the reason why I love those shorter letters is because they're so practical. They were writing them to baby Christians. They were writing these letters to to growing Christians. And they were teaching them how to apply God's word and how to be a follower of Jesus in their marriage, with their children, with their co-workers, in their community. They were encouraging them now, since you're a follower of Jesus, how you ought to live. And they're very simple and they're very short and they're very direct and to the point. So I want to encourage you first, begin to go to one of the shorter letters of the Bible inside the New Testament. And here's what I do. When I read the Bible, I'll read these shorter letters typically in one sitting. I'll get up in the morning and if I'm going through Ephesians, I'll turn to Ephesians and I'll read it one time all the way through. And as I read it all the way through, when, one of a, uh, when a verse stands out to me or a thought stands out to me or there's something that makes me go, huh, I underline it and then I move on. Because I find that if, I, if, I, if I, my goal is to read the, the letter and I start dwelling on that one verse, I never get through it. And so I read that entire letter all in one sitting And when a verse stands out to me, all I do is underline it in my Bible. Then I move on. The next morning is when the fun starts to happen. The next morning, I open up my Bible again to Ephesians and I hit the very first verse that stood out to me. And I type it out on my tablet and I begin to meditate on that verse. Why did this verse stand out to me? What is it that God is trying to teach me from this passage of scripture? And I meditate on it by looking for specks. I ask myself, did this verse leap out to me because there is a sin to avoid or confess in my life? Is God trying to show me that there's a sin right now that I need to avoid? Or is there a sin right now that I need to confess and stop doing? 
So uh, if I've been thinking about robbing a bank, if I've been thinking about committing murder, if I've been thinking about overeating tacos, then I, I, then I acknowledge I need to avoid doing those things. Those are bad things. Those are wrong things, and I don't want to do them. But mostly I don't struggle with temptation in those areas. But I am tempted in the areas of lust. I am tempted in the areas of gossip. I'm tempted in the areas of greed and of selfishness and resentment. And I'm tempted in the areas of bitterness and unforgiveness. And so when I read God's word and I'm seeing those verses that stand out to me, I let God's word transform my thinking. And if there is a sin that I need to avoid or confess, I begin to write about it and I begin to journal about it. And then secondly, I ask myself if this verse leaped out to me because there is a promise to claim. Is there a promise to claim in this verse? Is, is that why this verse is leaping out at me? Because there's a promise that God knows I need to acknowledge and claim for my personal life. Within the New Testament, there are over 250 promises to followers of Jesus. And here are just a couple of them, uh, a couple of them as examples for followers of Jesus. Jesus promised followers rest in Matthew 11:28 28 through 30. Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As you walk through the valley of life, as you walk through discouraging moments, as you walk through seasons of life that are overwhelming and are hurtful, Jesus' promise of rest is for you. That is a promise that you can claim as you're reading through God's word. Jesus also promised abundant life in John 10:10. 10, 10. He was talking about the evil one and he said the thief's purpose, the devil's purpose is to steal, to kill and destroy. And then he said, "But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly." See, there, there are many more promises that God makes to us throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament, but every single one of the promises that you're going to encounter in Scripture is fulfilled through a personal life-changing relationship with Jesus. So if there's a promise, I claim it. I write it down. I write about how it's impacting me. I pray it into my heart and life. And thirdly, I ask myself, did this scripture pop out to me because there is an example to follow? Is there an example to follow? Is that why this verse stood out to me? Am I supposed to, to follow the example of somebody that I'm reading about? Is there an example to follow? Maybe a Bible character's strength or maybe their faithfulness, or maybe their obedience, or maybe their sacrifice. Does somebody, does this Bible character, does this Bible example inspire me to walk with God more closely? And if so, then I write about it. I journal about it. I write about why that example stands out to me and how I can demonstrate that best in my personal life. Fourth, I ask myself, is there a command to obey? Is there a command to obey? Is there an area of my life that I need to bring into alignment with God's word? And if so, what is it? I write about it. I apply it to my life. And what I often find is there are commands that throughout the letters that I once obeyed, and no longer, I'm, I, am I no longer obeying? Or, or they're not as prominent as they once were. There are commands that I've become relaxed in obeying and following. Am I no longer generous like I once was? Am I, am I loving others with patience and kindness and thoughtfulness? Am I being kind and tenderhearted to my spouse, to my family, to my friends? Am I following Jesus like God expects followers of Jesus to follow Jesus? And if so, 
then I write about it. I talk about it in my prayer time with God. And finally, I ask myself, did this verse stand out to me simply because it has some bit of knowledge to gain? Is it just something about this passage of scripture that's some kind of insight for me personally? Or is there insight about God or my fellow man that I need to be reminded of, that I need to tuck away and even pass along to other people? You'll never know how much of an encouragement that you can be to other people if you are in the habit of reading God's word on a regular basis, applying it to your life, and then passing on God's word to other people who are struggling, other people who are discouraged. When you can give them a word of hope, not pointing your finger, but sharing from the bountiful blessing that God is blessing you with, sharing from an abundance of your understanding of God's word that you can bring some insight, you can bring some encouragement, you can bring something to somebody else in their relationship with Jesus. Now, I've given you some solid questions that you can ask yourself as you read God's word. And the reason for that is simple because we believe that God's truth should be relatable. It shouldn't be hard for you and I to understand God's word. When God spoke to the men and the women, when God spoke to the Hebrews and the Israelites and he spoke to followers of Jesus, it was simple. They didn't have to go crack a, uh, some type of uh, complex book formula to understand what God was trying to say. He spoke to them in the language that they understood so that they could apply it to their lives. These things will help your mind stay focused and help you stay alert as you read God's word. If you wanna stay awake when you're reading God's word, if you wanna keep your mind from drifting off, do these things. Ask yourself these five questions. Is there a sin to avoid? Is there a promise to claim? Is there an example to follow? Is there a command to obey? Is there knowledge to gain or pass on? Somebody passed that on to me in 1996 and I'm passing it on to you. It has changed my life. So now ask yourself this question. What is my daily plan to read God's word? What is my daily plan to read God's word? See, it doesn't matter what the church values about God's word if you don't value God's word. It doesn't matter our focus on relatable truth if you don't care about how to apply God's word to your life. So what is your plan to apply God's word to your life? What is your daily plan to read God's word? Will you wake up 30 minutes earlier every day to read the Bible? Well, maybe not, but some of you might. Will you go to bed 30 minutes earlier to read God's word? Maybe not all of you, but some of you might. Can you carve out a time in your 24 hours of living every single day, can you carve out seven minutes to spend time with God? Can you carve out 20 minutes? Can you carve out 30 minutes? If you want to experience life change, you'll apply God's word to your life on a regular basis. You'll get up, you'll soak in it, you'll let God's word change you and transform you and you'll begin to follow Jesus a little more closely and your relationship with him is gonna grow. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for 2 Timothy 3.16. We thank you that all scripture is God-breathed, that all scripture can change us and teach us what is right and wrong and how to live our lives. And Lord, we thank you for just relatable truth that, that the Bible is practical and it's simple for us to understand. And Lord, forgive us because at times we make it complicated and we make it difficult, but it is sure so easy to follow you and apply your word to our lives. And so Lord, we ask that you would help us to have that same value that we do here at Calvary as, as a church, as a living, breathing organization. Help us each to have the value of relatable truth, to hold it dear, 
and to apply it to our own hearts and lives, letting your word encourage us, change us, and challenge us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said,